having me and for organizing the seminar. Um, so yeah, the, the project that I would like to discuss with you today runs under the title of Because Networks, um, Alignment is All We Need for Interpretability. Um, and it's a work that is currently under submission, but I'll provide a link to a current preprint at the end of the talk. And I'll also try to upload a full version, including supplement and so on, um, to archive by the end of next week. Um, by the way, if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to drop me. Um, I'm happy to take questions when they come up. So um, let me first like set the stage a bit for the project. As you all know, deep neural networks are powerful classifiers. They excel at a wide range of tasks. Um, but they have one problem, and I think um, this simple example here might help illustrate this. Um, so while a pre-trained deep neural network is an amazing classifier, um, especially for images like this one here that is ambiguous in which one is the correct class label, um, we might we, we start wondering, right, like why, why does the classifier classify this image as a goldfinch? Because there's a second class present also. And, in order to be able to trust these models, um, it would be nice to get an explanation and to get a feeling for which features the network focuses on uh, to arrive at this decision. Um, so there are other reasons also for, for which we might want an explanation. So one of them is building trust. This is especially um, crucial for high stakes situations such as medical applications or autonomous driving, of course. Um, but also it might allow us to detect biases that the models learn, um, which would then allow us to potentially mitigate these biases and create a fairer machine learning system. Um, but ultimately it's also about satisfying our curiosity, right? And understanding how the networks work. And um, potentially this might also enable us with a better understanding to build better models in, in the first place. Um, but such explanations also, of course, have to fulfill certain requirements for them to be useful. So one of them uh, would be that these explanations need to be faithful to the underlying model, which essentially just means that they need to accurately reflect some aspect of the model computations. Um, and another one, of course, an explanation always is targeted to some audience, right? So another important aspect of an explanation is that it's interpretable by that target audience because otherwise not much is gained by giving an explanation in the first place. And an example of this is also a complete explanation is always given by the model itself, right? Um, but this is the problem that we're facing that we cannot really understand how this model actually solves the given task. And to exemplify this a bit, um, let's look at one particular um, neural network here, VGG11 which we can try to explain. There are various explanation methods out there, right? So one of them might be just the gradient with respect to the input image that I visualize here. And in, in these images, red colors denote positive um, gradients and blue colors denote negative gradients. Um, and so especially for BGG, I think it's interesting to note that BGG is a piecewise linear model. So the gradient actually faithfully summarizes the model computations to, to some degree, because it actually reflects the linear aspect of the model accurately. So it can be seen as a faithful method for explaining the models. However, it is, I think we can agree, a bit hard to interpret and a bit hard to understand why the model now says Goldfinch if this is the explanation. There are, of course, other methods out there. Um, for example, guided back propagation is one of them, um, which immediately shows a lot more structure in the explanation. So this might make us think, okay, so maybe this is actually an interpretable um, explanation. It shows a lot of structure, although um, given that both birds are highlighted, we might, might already start wondering um, why, why, like, why does this then lead to goldfinch because also the other class is highlighted. Right? Um, but how about the, the faithfulness? And for this, uh, Bio et al. had a great paper in, in 2018 in which they introduced some sanity checks for, for such explanation methods. Um, and specifically, if you want, if you think that an explanation method is faithful to the underlying model and reflects the computations of the underlying model, then the explanation should surely change if you change the model, right? Um, and so this is the test or one of the tests that they propose. Um, and I now start randomizing the layers of the VGG network here. And you see that randomizing one layer actually almost doesn't um, lead to any change in the, in the explanation method. 
and with two layers, almost no change. And this is already 15% of the parameters of the network randomized um, with five layers, which is 96% of the network parameters randomized. Uh, we still clearly see the same structure that in the beginning led us to believe that maybe this method gives us an interpretable explanation, right? So in, in terms of faithfulness, I think um, this leads us, or like this might lead us to conclude that guided backward propagation, for example, is not a really faithful um, explanation method. And there are, of course, other methods out there that I won't go into detail um, today. The main point is that I wanted to set the stage kind of for what we're trying to do in our work. Uh, we want to develop a neural network model that inherently produces explanations that are both faithful and interpretable um, from the start. So um, the way that we do this is um, by two concepts around which I will try to structure the talk today. Uh, the one is dynamic linearity, which is supposed to ensure the faithfulness of the models. Um, and the other one is alignment pressure, which leads to the fact that these faithful summaries of the models are or are more interpretable in the end than the, the summaries that we get for other models. Um, okay, so in the in the following, I will structure, as I said, the talk around these two concepts to explain how the because networks work. And after that, I'll show you some quantitative and qualitative results. Okay, so let's start with dynamic linearity um, and have a look inside of these models. As any deep neural network, the because network is also made up of multiple because layers in this case. Um, and in terms of dynamic linearity, the important aspect of these layers is that they compute a dynamic linear transformation of their inputs. So each of these layers actually just linearly transforms their inputs, um, which um, maybe two, two things to point out here. Um, of course, these need to be nonlinear, these linear transformations. That's, that's why I call them dynamic linear. So the linear transformation matrices are input dependent at every layer. But an important aspect of this is that given that they are just a like sequence of linear transformations in the end that are input dependent, but still linear, um, we can summarize the entire model by just one linear transformation. This is actually similar to the piecewise linear models that I showed before. Um, so the explanation that I showed here to the right is actually just the corresponding row of the matrix of this linear transformation matrix that corresponds to the Goldfinch class. And uh, to make this point uh, like overly clear, maybe, um, this means that if we compute the scalar product between the input image and the Goldfinch explanation, we actually get the exact class logic that the model produces. And applying the sigma function, we actually get the class probability of the model. And of course, so this is the explanation for one of the classes that is present in the image. This is the Goldfinch class. We can also look at another row. So for example, the row corresponding to the indigo bunting that is present in the image, and we get an according explanation. Um, so the main point about this dynamic linearity then is that dynamic linearity allows us to faithfully summarize the sequence of transformations or in, um, the entire model by just one linear transformation. Um, but as I said already, right, the piecewise linear model has the same aspect actually as piecewise linear model at every layer transforms the input with a dynamically chosen linear transformation where you typically just um, apply a ReLU and which is equivalent to zeroing out certain rows in the, in the transformation matrices. Um, so this begs the question then, why should this matrix that we have here start aligning with relevant features in the input? And for this, I get to the second point, which is the alignment pressure. And before I get to how the because networks actually compute their output, um, let me give you a high level idea of how it works. So the, the, the entire framework is kind of built on this um, observation that if you optimize a network with the binary cross entropy loss, um, you essentially maximize the network outputs at, for every given input, right? So either you maximize the class logic of the correct class or you maximize the negative class logic of the incorrect classes. And the, the core idea behind our approach is that we want to constrain the model such that 
large outputs so the maximal outputs can be achieved only under like specific conditions that we specify and the conditions that we want to set for this is that we only want to allow large outputs if the weights align with the input and then the the hope is that this means that the optima that the model converges to will exactly show that will exactly show weight input alignment um, in in the local optima that the model converges to um, and more specifically the way that we do this is by by two aspects we bound the outputs of any given layer um, and at the same time we also suppress outputs of the network whenever a neuron has a weight vector that is not well aligned with the input. So every neuron computes the scalar product of its weight vector with the input, right? And we suppress whenever there is low alignment between uh, weights and inputs. And for a qualitative idea of what this, what this leads to, um, here I show in the following some examples of different networks that have been trained on Cypher 10 with different suppression factors. And I show you the explanations given by the models with different suppression factors. So the first one is actually a piecewise linear model um, where we visualize the, um, the corresponding row for the two classes, so horse or car. And once you start increasing the suppression factor, um, you see that the alignment of the model starts increasing and the corresponding linear transformation that the model computes. So this dynamic linear um, transformation that summarizes the entire model computations um, starts aligning with past relevant features and becomes much more interpretable. Oh, question. Yes. Yeah, is this equivalent to having gradles with like lower bias? Since I understand that like non aligned things like that the dot product is negative and you can make it dot product. Um, so, so we actually like in these networks, we actually don't use any, any nonlinearities apart from the transformation itself. So there's no value anymore. Um, or actually we do use one, which we can discuss in the end maybe, um, but there is no value in, in this case anymore. Um, but I'll get to actually the exact, um, computation in the next slide actually. And I think the easiest way to, to explain these computations that we perform is by starting from the linear transformation that is used in any standard DNN for the neurons. And then, like, highlight the differences to, to ours. And of course, like, the linear transformation is, as I said, scalar product between the white vector and the input, which can be written as the product of the norms of the vectors times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. And so, th this angle between the two vectors already like highlights, like, this is, this is something relating to alignment between the two vectors, right? So, I rewrite this one more time, just taking the absolute value of the cosine times the sine, which doesn't change anything. But if we now look at the because transformation that we introduced, um, we can easily see differences to, to this transformation with respect to the linear transformation. And the main differences are that on the one hand, the weight vectors are of unit norm. So we fix them to unit norm, which I tried to indicate by this hat operator. Um, and secondly, we potentiate the absolute value of the cosine term by, by a parameter b, which is supposed to like increase the alignment. And um, I prepared a little toy example here. I hope this helps to, to um, make clear why, why this actually increases alignment. So what I show here, um, let me maybe do this like this. So on the left and on the right, so here and, and here, you see two different classification problems um, where in both of these cases, the red class is the same and there's a second class, the gray class, which changes positions. And what I show in the center is the binary cross entropy loss for these two different um, classification problems, dependent on the on the angle of the weight vector that is used in these transformations. So this W here, and um, the last part I guess that I that is highlighted here in these images um, is that I try to highlight how the optima look like. So here, this is a zoom in basically for the correct for the optimum of this classification problem. Um, we see that like this is what you would expect, right? It's a like it's a linearly separable problem. So the linear transformation or the linear classifier like separates this accurately. But there's two things to notice. Um, so the red class in these settings is the same, right? Um, however, the the linear classification vector changes dramatically between these two um, classification problems, which is of course something that we would expect. But thinking about explanations using the weight vectors of a piecewise linear model, 
um, we see that these explanations might be very dependent on the setting and on the on other classes that are present in the training um, in the training of the model. Um, exactly, and another thing is that they that they don't actually really highlight they don't have much to do actually with the red class by itself, but actually they relate to the difference between the two classes. Um, so, but if we start increasing the, the parameter B now, um, we actually can change the, the loss landscape of the models. And specifically, we observe two things that with increasing B, the optima of the two classification problems start converging to the same point. And this point specifically is then the like perfectly aligned weight vector with the class cluster, with the red class cluster. Um, and so maybe one more, I, I'm not sure if I, if I mentioned this. So for B equals one, of course, the, the because transformation is a linear transformation, right? So we can smoothly interpolate between like a strongly aligning because transformation and a linear transformation to circle. Okay, and to, to summarize the main properties of this um, because transformation, um, I'll rewrite it also one more time uh, like this. It's just like rearranging the terms a little bit. Um, but this highlights what I already mentioned before, um, that the because transformation is dynamic linear, which is supposed to be, um, or which is exemplified by, by this way of writing it. It's just using a dynamic weight vector to transform the input. Um, so this is the first aspect. Um, secondly, what you might notice if you look at, at this part here, um, the because transformation is bounded. Um, because it is a unit norm weight vector on the one hand that is scaled by a scalar that is smaller or equal to one. Um, and the last part is that this transformation has its maximal output exactly when the two weight vectors or the weight vector aligns with the input to the neuron. And importantly, these three properties that are not, like right now I'm talking about a single transformation in the network. Um, but the important part is that all of these trans, like all of these properties are inherited um, by the network as a whole. Because if you think about it, oh yeah, you have a question. Uh, sorry, just can you go back to the yeah. previous slide? So especially on the on the animation that we did, yeah. it, it looks like there will be a trade-off between so the reason the weight vector is aligning in such a way that it separates only the class planes in the, in the previous case yeah. has an implication for generalization of the weight vector. So, so it, this, yes. So in case where you have like less examples, so yes. that you don't want essentially this looks like a regularization, applying like a regularization where you are kind of like looking for a com complex shape to fit the class compared to the, the yes the, the minimal possible shape. So um, it, I, I thought you probably have um, some thought about this. So do you have a comment on like how the suppression factor results or affects generalization um, for your the models that you're training? Yeah, so um, I will get to like some examples of generalization on the ImageNet uh, data set in, in a bit. Um, but, but I think it's a really important point because so I think maybe let me go back once more. Uh, yeah, so, so in the linear case, exactly when, when you say generalization, right, like this, this has like two sides of the coin, I guess, because what you, what you see is that the model would be very confidently classifying something that falls into, into this regime down here as a red class, right? Like, which you can call a generalization or like overgeneralization, right? Um, so, so this is definitely one aspect of it. Um, so if you, like one hope that um, might come with this is that also the because transformation might be more, um, like might reflect uncertainty better if it's actually like, um, because what, what you would notice is that in all of the white part now, the, the model actually outputs like essentially zero. If you take the sigma out of it, this would be 50%. And if you like add a specific bias term to it, you can basically have the model say zero percent probability for the red class whenever you're outside of that cone. So yeah, I think that there's definitely a trade-off between um, high confidence predictions, like generalizing high confidence predictions, um, and at the same time, an uncertainty um, um, how do you call that? Like some some better estimate of uncertainty in, in the models. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. So let me jump forward again. So the what I said here, these properties that we have: dynamic linearity, boundedness, and 
maximality under alignment, these are all properties that are inherited by a network that is made up of those transformations. Because if you have something that is dynamic linear and you have a sequence of this, of course, this is still given that you can collapse the individual matrices again to just one matrix, this remains dynamic linear. If the individual transformations are bounded, the overall sequence of transformations remains bounded. And uh, given that the input to one layer is the output of the previous one, um, and each layer can at most reproduce its input, in, like in terms of strength, um, this also means that the, the whole network can only be maximal if the individual layers align with their respective inputs. Um, yes. For example, to make what do you call it uh, dynamic linear again? Because um, my understanding is like these weights are fixed once you learn them. Yeah, exactly. That, that's that, exactly. I always like, like this is actually a weird concept, I think, because so the, the weight vectors themselves they're fixed. But um, if you look at this way of writing it, um, so what, what is fixed is this part here, right? This is the parameter. But then you have a, a scaling term that is input dependent. So this, the, the norm of the parameter that is fixed is scaled, and therefore the, the matrix transformation is also dependent on the input. And um, therefore, the whole thing like, is, is called dynamic linear. So and, and this is actually already, like for now, I guess, like all the details to how the because networks are, are set up. So now for some results. Um, first, I'll go over some uh, quantitative results and then show some qualitative results for the explanations that these models can produce. Um, but before that, maybe one quick interlude. Um, how do we actually measure interpretability? How do we quantify how interpretable the models are? And in this project specifically, we employ the grid pointing game, um, which, which is essentially um, evaluating models on synthetic grids of images on which, the, like, so the model has been trained on the individual sub images, like on a standard ImageNet um, data set, and then they're evaluated on these grids. And um, what we do is we measure how well an explanation method, for example, I don't know, this could be the gradient or the model inherent explanations, how well these explanations localize the correct sub image for the corresponding class. So each of these sub or each of these grids has each class at most once in the grid. So you would hope that an explanation would highlight only the corresponding sub image in the grid. And then you just measure how much positive attribution does the model attribute to the sub image that corresponds to a class relative to the overall positive attribution that this explanation method um, produces. Okay, so this as a quick interlude, but uh, now to the to the results, I guess this kind of answers or goes in answering your question regarding the generalization performance. So we, we saw that the because transformation is very similar to the linear transformation, right? With B equals one, it is actually a linear transformation, um, which makes it easy, like very easy to replace the corresponding linear transformation in standard models and just make them because models by replacing the, the linear transformation part by because transformation. Um, which means that this whole approach is highly compatible with standard network approaches. Um, and what we see here on the left is that, like what we tried is we, we converted standard models, for example, ResNet, DenseNet, DGG, and InceptionNet to such because networks. And we find that after training, like of course we need to train from scratch because we like heavily changed the model architectures. Um, we find that it's almost like that it's possible to almost recover the or like the baseline accuracies, um, despite the fact, and we can discuss that maybe a bit more in detail later. Despite the fact that actually these models now don't have any batch normalization layers, no uh, rectified linear units, um, no max pooling. It's basically just all completely like the the only um, nonlinearity that is in there is uh, the max out operation. But we can talk about this maybe later. What what kind of effect this has? Um, but equally importantly, I guess, is that these models um, exhibit a high degree of inherent, inherent interpretability. Um, so what I show here is like the results of the localization metric, this grid pointing game that I, that I introduced just now, where a score of one means that you perfectly localize for each of the sub-images and a score of zero point or like one over nine 
means that you basically have random attributions all over the grid image. And for this, like just to make clear, like the, the test was actually run on a, on a three by three grid instead of a two by two grid. Um, so and what we did here, just to maybe also to say that again, so the, the blue one here is the model inherent explanation. This is the, basically the contribution coming from a specific region um, relative to the linear transformation that the model computes. And then we have other post hoc um, explanation methods that we also try to um, that we also use for explaining the model decisions, where some of them, Lyme and Grad Camp, for example, perform well, um, but not as well as the as the model inherent explanations. And uh, so now maybe some some qualitative examples. Um, so here I show some of the images from the ImageNet validation set, and um, which are correctly classified. And uh, the model then produces these explanations along with the prediction for why this is classified as the specific class and why some of the images seem to, to highlight a lot because the, the class object actually also covers a lot of the, the image region. You see that the, that the explanations are um, also like quite selective, for example, in, in these parts where the background is not reproduced at all, but only the, the corresponding class features are actually aligned with by the model. Um, and just to put this maybe in context, um, here are some explanations regarding some of these post hoc methods that we also evaluated. And while we do, while we do see agreement between, between them to some degree, um, the model inherent explanations are, are a lot more detailed. And importantly, they're actually model inherent. So they're not post hoc approximations of the model behavior, but they actually are direct reflections of the linear transformation that the model applied to the input. And they reflect the weights that the model has learned. And uh, what this also allows us is that given that we have the sequence of dynamic linear transformations, we can actually compute explanations for any given activation in the network because the logits are no different from any activation that you might compute at intermediate stages. And uh, so maybe to help you parse this image here, um, what, I, what I show now in the following are some explanations for some of the most highly activating neurons over the um, validation set. Um, and specifically, I sorted the images according to the strength of the activation and then visualize the explanation for the individual activation. So in the, in the top row, I show the strongest six, like the images that contain the strongest six activations. And specifically, the, the blue dotted or blue dashed box corresponds to the actual highest um, activation in this image. And then I also show the second highest non-overlapping activation in the same image to show that the neuron corresponds or like activates also on similar parts that are at different positions in the image. And then in, in the bottom row, I show like the next, I think this is 25 or something, the next 25 highest activations where I just show the, the, um, the explanation that is shown in the, in the dash blue box. And what we find is that these neurons, um, in, to some degree, as expected, correspond to very specific um, concepts. So here we have a wheel neuron. Uh, then we find also a face neuron that um, is able to align very well with faces and um, therefore activate strongly on faces. We have a dog tongue neuron, um, which I think is interesting because you can also see the specificity of this neuron. Um, in this image where the dog doesn't actually have the tongue out um, and the, the activation is much, much lower than in the other images. Um, and then lastly, coming back to something that I said in the very beginning about debugging models, um, we also find um, various neurons actually that um, align with watermarks in, in um, images. And um, this, this goes into this um, direction that if you have a model that explains its decision, it might help you uncover data set biases uh, because we find that watermarks, while not semantically meaningful, maybe, um, they do, um, they are not equally distributed. They're not uniformly distributed over the classes in the ImageNet data set. And they're actually highly informative of which classes um, this, like which classes have the watermark and which ones don't. So this is actually for the model, a useful feature to learn although it might not be a semantically meaningful one to us. All right, and with this, um, let me summarize. So what I said in the beginning is that explanations should be both faithful and interpretable. 
and um, we try to get one step into that direction with our because networks by uh, designing them to be dynamic linear on the one hand, which ensures that we can extract some explanation that is um, that is model faithful. It's actually an accurate representation of what the model computes. And to achieve interpretability, um, we induce alignment pressures such that these dynamic linear matrices that we use to transform the input actually align with the features of the objects that the model is trying to detect. Um, and then finally, we, we can include this, or we can integrate the because transformation in standard networks and find that they are competitive classifiers that provide um, interpretable explanations for their decisions. And uh, with this, I want to thank my supervisors, Margaret Fritz from the CISPA Helmut Center and Dan Schiele um, from the Max Planck Institute. And um, if you have any questions, happy to, to discuss with you. And by the way, this is the URL if you're interested to having in having a look at the current preprint. I have a question. Yes. Uh, what does it take to transform a standard neural network to a because network? Yeah, um, I have a slide for that. Let me check quickly. So it is actually um, quite straightforward. Um, you don't actually have to do much. So the only thing that we do is um, whenever we convert um, a standard network to a because network, we replace all the linear transformations, which would be, for example, the convolutional kernels are, instead of being a convolutional kernel that is linear, we take the, the because transformation. Um, I'll get to the max out in a second, but apart from that, we just make sure that there's no other nonlinearities in the network to not basically confuse the explanations to make sure that the explanations, that the alignment pressure is there, that everything is exactly according to the standard because network. And uh, we take out any normalization layer like batch norm, group norm, and so on. So we basically, this is what we do to convert them. And the max out units is just something that we also like tested. Um, so we, for any unit that we have, we actually represent it by two units and forward the maximum activation of them. Um, but we actually, what, what we thought in the beginning that this is something that is also necessary in order to, to get high performing models. But what we found is actually that you can also train them completely without any additional nonlinearity. So the only nonlinearity necessary to train the models is actually the because transformation. Apart from that, no, no other um, nonlinear transformation is necessary. And you replace the max pool by another by average pooling. Yeah, just so because average pooling doesn't have is is not nonlinear. And, um, but what you could also do is you could also take out the like the pooling operation overall and just use strider convolution that also works. Um, so we, we we tested a couple of different uh, things, but the one that we um, ended up using just to not change the the overall structure too much is just replacing by average pooling. You had a question. Okay. The, the the explanations. Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's um, that's a good point. That, that is actually directly, yeah. I think that's that's. Um, let me go to to some of these explanations. Um, so the color coding is actually directly like image colors. It's directly the angle of the of the transformation matrix. So you you have a weight vector um, that points in a specific direction at each image pixel, and we just decode this angle into colors. Which is, is not immediately possible if you have an RGB image, right? Because like the like the color one zero zero is, for example, the same one in terms of direction as two hundred fifty five zero zero, right? So it would be difficult to decode directly into colors if you just have the angle accessible. And this is the only thing that we have um, because the norm is not standardized by the transformation. So what we do for this is actually we encode the images um, as RGB and then one minus R, one minus G, one minus B which disentangles the norm of the input from the angle. So every color actually has a unique angle. And this allows us to then convert the, the angles of our transformation matrix, the, the W into colors directly. So this is actually um, not a color coding in the sense that the colors mean something specific, but it's just like the angle of the, of the transformation matrix. Same color is same color. Yeah. Same color is what, sorry? Same color. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And so, so this, this shows that the model is actually um, able to 
align with like certain colors, especially the ones that are, I guess are important. For example, um, this one here in the in the in the peacock is um, is well aligned, but some some other colors, for example, the white of the of these um, what are they called uh, these birds. <laughs> Um, is is not as white, and depending, I guess, on the on the importance, also there might be more or less error in the in the angle that the model um, computes. Um, but exactly, that's that's what we visualize here. I have more, I guess, a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. So your approach, compared to like other approaches, in the that most use post hoc explanation. Yeah. Um, this approach is more like a like take apart the model and keep them in. Yeah. Um, this is just good from a point of view of like it provides better interpretability when you use that. But um, do you think this uh, like in your your opinion, like we people have been training models for longer, you know, so that they're like huge models and they perform really well, for example, on ImageNet, they say a model that performs like 90% or something like that. And obviously like retraining models uh, from scratch it's yeah. going to be like harder and harder going forward because of like data privacy and yeah. a number of other issues. So do you think like there is this is the way to go, or do you think like post hoc explanations are better uh, to work on in the future? I guess it's a philosophical question as well. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's a it's a very good point. Um, so the the reason why why I started with this is that I actually thought that you you need to understand the implications of your standard um, optimization procedures in terms of what it does to the weight, like which kinds of um, um, optima the model converges to. And, and for example, we, we, we see also in, in related work that while the gradient that I showed in the beginning is, is super noisy and not a good explanation, that once you train them with um, adversarial robustness constraints that the gradients actually also start aligning with the image. So you also get this alignment pressure, for example, with adversarial training. Um, and this, this kind of led me to, to believe that it will be difficult in general to find a post hoc explanation method that is stable regard, like basically regardless of the of the training procedure because the gradient for example can be a good explanation if you use adversarial training but it might not be if you use another um, training procedure and if you're agnostic to the optimization procedure i'm i'm not sure if we will if we do not include the optimization procedure in the post hoc explanation if we will find a general one that always applies um, I, I guess if we're able to understand how specific aspects like in terms of regularization um, or adversarial training and so on, how this affects the optima that the model converges to. Um, I'm not sure if we will find a method that takes the parameters of the model to produce an explanation. Other, other approaches, of course, are to, to try to treat the model in the first place as a black box classifier, um, perturb the inputs um, and, check the, and check the outputs um, to estimate how important certain features are. This works really well, right? Like the Lime, um, explanation does exactly that and actually seems to perform well in terms of explanation. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess it's a good point. If you, if you want to um, if you want to have an interpretable model, you might need to retrain it. But there's also, I guess, a lot of different applications where you might not care so much about interpretability. And then um, it's I guess you have to choose your trade. -off. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to. I have one last question. But, um, so you've trained a model which which is inherently more easier to interpret just based on the data from the yeah. model. So yeah. you can also, what you can also do is like consider this model as a black box mm -hmm. and provide this model as input to one of the post hoc explanation methods, like line or track or yeah. black box or something. Yeah. Um, so 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 this is what we what we see here. So. This is post hoc explanations uh, applied to the to the model. same model, uh, but I guess this touches on a on a great point. So, for example, we can also think about. So, this is now within one model, which explanation method is the best? That, that's the question I was going to because I don't remember that kind of being like super good somehow compared to line. So, I was like kind of yeah. So um, here, for example. These are the different models. So this is DenseNet, ResNet, VGG, and ExceptionNet after converting. So this is just within models still, like each model within. Um, and we see that across models, we get the best explanation with the model inherent explanations. 
but we can also check with respect to the pre-trained models. And so this, like the dash line here is supposed to make clear that the explanation is performed on a different model because the because transformation can only be applied to because networks. Uh, but just to give you a feeling of scale and how standard models would perform under these postdoc explanations. Um, and actually, Gratcam, you're right, produces very good um, explanations in general, but has like it has this global, I'm not sure how familiar you are with, with Gratcom, but it has this global average pooling over the gradients, uh, which actually makes it somehow um, agnostic again to, to the exact position. So it performs rather poorly on, on the localization game because like two things that have similar activations, if you use a pooled gradient, they might, um, Gratcom actually attributes importance also to other regions. Um, Exactly, but it's a very good point. And, and another point to add maybe is also that um, while th this is basically one set of experiments, but like a lot of um, post hoc explanation methods also have hyperparameters that you could try to tune, right? So like this is not claiming that you couldn't perform better with other um, post hoc explanation methods, but this at the same time also highlights one disadvantage of, of post hoc explanations. If you need to like tune them, it's also like, again, it raises this question of, what is an explanation if you need to tune like what what does the tuning do to the explanation is it just to satisfy our like semantic happiness that we that we think like ah now it highlights something that i was expecting so now this is a good explanation um or and how faithful it is so the hyperparameters always will choose some trade-off between the two things and it's unclear what exactly that is i would say all right there are any questions? Uh, thanks a lot, Maurice. Thank you. And